Okay, welcome everyone to our weekly webinar. Very grateful that you're with us. I have my colleagues Scott, Matt, Kent, uh, others in our community. Welcome. Today, per the email we sent out, we're going to work with uh, someone in our community, a client of ours named Shai, who is getting ready to self-surrender, and he's been kind enough to allow us to go through his reentry plan. And the plan is something that he created with our team, but he's really taken the lead in trying to demonstrate who he is, where he's going, where he's from, and why, of course, he'll never return to this really difficult system. A number of you have asked for like a release plan workshop, if you will. So consider this a release plan workshop, something that Shai did well. He, after every webinar, and he can, he'll touch on this, he immediately puts some plan of action into play. He will immediately like do something because it's fresh in his mind. There are some people who might attend the webinar and, and nothing happens. And again, that happened recently. Someone was on seven or eight webinars and claimed to have gone through all the webinars and 15 minutes before their surrender to the federal prison, we got about 70 text messages. What can I bring? Can I bring the medication? Should I bring cash? How do I do email? And it was unfortunate that they're spending the last 15 minutes asking those questions when apparently this person said he had been on eight or nine webinars. If you were on eight or nine webinars, you know what you can bring. You'll know how to avoid disciplinary infractions. You'll know how to deal with staff. You'll know how to set up core links and email and mail. But just in case, if any of you have forgotten, Scott, I'll ask you in, in the resource or the, the chat tab to please add resources from prison professors. We have the resource page, how to send email, how to send mail, how to do just about anything. Our nonprofit prison professors gives all of that away for free. The onus is on you just to read it, to learn, and implement it. Please spend some time every day going through the prison professor's website. We have myriad resources for you to consider and use, including just about everything you'll need to prepare for your surrender to, to prison. I want to make that very clear. Uh, Mr. Carper, Donald, Mr. Carper is here. I call you Mr. Carper to be formal. His son, Scott, has been in custody for a while. He's in Leavenworth. And an unfortunate situation where Scott was des lives in California, hoped to go to a prison in California, and was designated all the way to Kansas, but he's having a very productive experience, including documenting his journey every single week by way, of, by way of a newsletter. And the newsletters are fantastic. And I have gotten permission to share them. I haven't yet, but I will. I'm going to coordinate that process. But the newsletters are really terrific because he's sharing in, very intimate details. And, and something I want to touch on, something he wrote called, in fact, let me see if I can share my screen here one moment. Can you all see my screen okay, where it says craziest thing I heard saw at Leavenworth prison camp last week? Can you see that okay? Okay. Scott wrote, one of my fellow inmates came from Yazoo City Federal Prison Camp in Mississippi. He has a cousin at that camp that he has been trying to reach for over a month. They're super strict about contraband. A month ago, an inmate was caught with contraband, weed, and a phone. The warden went ballistic and ordered all 97 camp, in, camp inmates to be sent to the shoe, the hole, until the person who brought in the contraband came forward. Nobody came forward, so they just passed 30 days in the hole. The shoe is a tiny cell where you are only allowed one hour of wreck a day. It is brutal. The entire camp sent, the, sent to the shoe seems logistically impossible, but somehow they are making it work. I'm not sure if you can understand how crazy it is, but for us, it's insane. Okay. Then he wrote, one of the things I promised myself and everyone else is I would absolutely stay out of trouble. I've said to myself, I will avoid trouble in here at all costs. From the outside, you might say to yourself, that should be easy. It is not. Matter of fact, it is scary how easy it is to get into trouble, even if you try to be careful. The point I want to make is the littlest things, regardless of intent, can get you into trouble. It is completely up to the staff. They wield power. If you get on a correction officer's radar, they can make your life miserable. So of course, there's a story. Let me tell you about the close call I had this week. I was walking by my counselor's office and I noticed my name on a brand new list on his door. It is very difficult to track down either your counselor or case manager. So if you catch them in your office, you need to pounce. Also, 
So if you do see them, your time is limited to just a few minutes. Most of the interaction consists of them giving incredibly vague answers or telling you they are done with you and you need to get out. Anyway, my name was on the list, so I knocked on my counselor's door. He needed to see me since I had legal mail. For those of you who don't know, my father retired and let his law license expire. Due to my problems and the difficulty communicating, he unretired and got his license back. So as one of my attorneys, he sent me mail. The mail goes directly to my office. This mail must be open in the counselor's presence. My dad tried sending me the newsletter since they are part of what I do. My counselor opened the mail and immediately started chastising me for receiving mail he did not feel was legal mail. Now remember, it doesn't matter what I think. They are always right, even when they are wrong. I obviously made my case that the mail was legal. However, he wasn't having it. So we can go on with this, and, and I won't, but I think it's the, the takeaway for, for all of you. One, everyone who goes to prison says, I'm never going to get into trouble in prison. And it's the same people who frequently say, I never would have imagined that I would become immersed in a government investigation, yet yet here we are. Bad choices can happen, even if you're doing all you can to avoid bad choices. So when someone makes a bad decision, like drugs or vaping and iPhones, and they are more pervasive than ever, they're getting in by way of drones. Around these minimum security camps, you got drones dropping food and drugs. It's trouble. And if you're associating with people who do those sorts of things, you will be guilty by association. It's part of why we say when you go to prison, you've got to be very cautious about forming friendships. They should happen organically because if you surrender, you can form a friendship with someone who you don't know might speak to staff, might have many iPhones, might sell drugs, generally complain all day, which can be loathed. And just like that, you intend to have good, your, your good goals in prisons go by, go by the wayside because you're associating with the wrong people. So we encourage you as you prepare to go in to let friendships happen organically. And you know what? If that means you don't form any friendships, you don't form any friendships. It's all good. You need to be preparing, creating your release plan with your intention to come home strong and, and ready that you can find a great deal of privacy in prison. It was surprising to me how much time I spent alone in prison, but let friendships happen organically. And also, when one person does something wrong, it ruins it for the whole camp, right? So we just read that piece from Scott's newsletter. So one, imagine spending time in the hole as a result of something you didn't do. That prisoner will be ostracized, kicked aside. There are problems for him. It's hard to build a release plan and be productive and grow and document it if the whole camp hates you. The problem is that guy probably had some good friends in the camp. And now those people are, again, guilty by association because they knew them. Now their journey is harder. Lay low, let friendships happen organically, and recognize even if you have good intention, bad things can happen, as Scott wrote with respect to the legal mail. Something we've covered in myriad episodes is the quadrant theory, right? Can anyone recall the, the four quadrants, high risk, high risk, low reward, low reward, reward? Can anyone, before I get into the release plan with Shy, I want to spend a few more minutes on just kind of some prison adjustment stuff. Does anyone recall that? The high, high, low, low? Can anyone just jump in and tell me what that, that means? Unmute yourself and tell me what that means, please. Because what we don't want is someone to say they attended eight webinars where we give you everything. And then 15 minutes before you're surrendered to prison, we get 70 text messages from someone asking if they should bring in their PSR, right? Asking if they should talk about that they got a cooperation agreement, asking how to send emails. So let's make sure I want this to be collaborative and interactive. Walk me through the quadrant theory again, if you would. Someone. Um, high risk, high reward. Yeah, give me one. Okay. Example would be um, maybe something that uh, you just showed. Okay, the, there is there is obviously some risk to sending out a newsletter, but there's a high reward. Exactly um, right. At the end of the tunnel. Anyone else? Um, some, go ahead. Okay. Um, we had low risk, low reward being TV. I disagree with that. I think I think actually TV can be high risk, low reward, um, based on the characters that might be hanging around the TV versus. I mean, the biggest fights to me were in front of, over the TV, uh, but that is an example that you set forth. Um, that, that's right. That, that that's exactly right. It, it's a subjective process. There are people who would say that TV room is low risk, low reward. Others would say it's high risk because you're in the TV room where fights and gambling can take place and certainly low reward. So you've got to own your own, use your own skill set to determine what makes best for your proactive prison routine. But what I would encourage you to do is assess every 
decision you make, what quadrant doesn't fall into. Certainly, it, and we said this in our prior webinars, it's higher risk, high reward to do what Mr. Carper's son is doing for this very reason. He's documenting his journey. Staff is aware of it. It can be off-putting to other prisoners if they know about it. When I was documenting my journey in federal prison, some staff, they approved it, but some prisoners, some prisoners, got, got, some some prisoners got a little jealous because it was on the internet and their wives or spouse or mothers would send in my blog and say, why aren't you as productive as Justin? Why aren't you doing this? And some of the guys got very upset, like, hey, why are you blowing the whistle on what's taking place in here? I don't want my family to know. Why? Well, because some prisoners call home and make it seem like time in a minimum security camp is the hardest thing anyone's ever endured. Then they get off the phone and play spades and blackjack and dominoes and run 15 miles around the track in Olympic time fashion. And they don't want their family to know that it can be party time 101 inside of these camps, which it can't be for some. So it is certainly higher risk, high reward if you're going to document if you're going to write to that end, Scott Laney, jump in for a moment. Scott, I know you documented your journey. Not everyone has fallout from it. Was it always supportive for you or did you get any pushback because of the daily blog that you wrote? Um, you know, someone found it on an iPhone one day and boy, word spread quick in the camp. Some people were really enthused and liked the stories. Other people were a little bit off put by it. Um, however, if I could go back in time, I, I wouldn't change a thing. I would do it again, documenting the journey changed the entire experience for me so we're, we're going to put up all these links in, in the chat when we send out the replay we'll include these links in a moment uh, one last thing something that michael helped me understand in federal prison does anyone recall kind of this u-shaped curve that we that we described i'll summarize it for you in a minute there's this metaphorical u that michael santos helped me understand when i went to prison and here's the theory behind it when you surrender to, to federal prison you're beginning to descend this you. You're leaving your family behind, you're stressed, you're nervous, you're scared about prison, you're ascending this you. Then when you get to like the halfway point of your sentence, you're at the bottom of this metaphor for you. That's when you have the best job, the best bunk, you're adjusted, you're rocking and rolling, you know that prison is fine, your family is adjusted without you. Yes. Then you begin to then you begin to ascend the you. And as you ascend the you, all the fears reemerge. How are you going to pay your bills, health insurance, mortgage, rent, restitution? What are you going to do on probation? What is your job in the halfway house? Are you serving donuts? Or are you working from home? Are you volunteering? All of the anxieties pop up. It's part of the reason short-termitis is a real thing in federal prison, where when you get closer to going home, you don't enjoy the release like you think you're going to. For many, including me, you begin to think, my God, what's going to happen on the other side? So our advice is begin to ascend the you from that first day, whereas most people wait all the way until the end. And it tends to be too late, which is why so many people in the halfway house lament going to the halfway house and wish they were back inside of the minimum security prison. Begin ascending the you the moment you surrender to prison. Now, before we go to the release plan, I want to share the reality. There are those of you who may create a release plan, and it might not have the impact that you like. And as we frequently say, we can't change the past and we cannot guarantee what's going to happen moving forward. But we do believe in advocacy of changing the narrative, of creating a new record through your own efforts. And to that end, I won't go through the whole message, but our team received a message from someone, um, from a spouse, and she was very frustrated that her husband created this reentry plan and the case manager kind of ignored it, poo-pooed it a little bit and said, this is very good, this is helpful, but I'm not going to make it a part of the central file. And the prisoner wants it to be part of the file because he wants probation and everyone to see it. And the case manager said, I can see how this is helpful, but I'm not going to do it. And I want to just read Michael's response to you. I'm sorry to read that Scott is having difficulty with his case manager, but Scott will be able to use the plan to advocate for himself as he moves forward in the journey. He will be able to present it to the case manager that he meets in the halfway house. The important point is that he has created a release plan. Although, although it would have been great if the case manager put the plan in the file, it will still be better for him that he is able to present it at the halfway house. And again, he will be able to use the plan when he meets his probation officer. The work he has done will help those people see that Scott has developed a plan. These are the kinds of tools I use to overcome challenges from staff, but staff members can bring challenges. I use these kinds of plans to overcome these challenges. Encourage him, let him know that this plan will make him a better case for his liberty. I'd like you and Scott to remember that it's a long journey through the system. Sometimes we encounter problems. We can only work to put ourselves in a better position. His release plan will put him in a better position of overcoming those challenges. But there are challenges in prison, in the halfway house, and while on supervised release. The plan helps a person 
and persuade those leaders to see him differently. I use those plans to overcome obstacles, but sometimes resistance will come. We must continue to develop the plan and show that we know how to overcome obstacles. So again, I'll say it, there is a absolute chance you create a plan, you give it to your case manager and like throws it in the trash. You don't give up. It may influence somebody else down the road. You've got to build it. If you don't try, you got you have absolutely nothing. To that end, I'd like to welcome in my co-host, Shai. Other than being a UCLA Bruin, he's a hard worker and, and I admire him very much. Shai reached out to our team in preparations for his upcoming six months surrender to federal prison. Shai, so can you jump in and just give us a quick summary of, of who you are and on your getting ready to surrender to prison? And then we're gonna dive into your actual release plan that you created. Sure. So um, <clears throat> my process has been going on for almost five years because my case was back in 2018. I took it through every level of appeal. Uh, I wanted to make sure that at the end of the day, I knew I tried everything I could. So from, you know, en banc appeal to Supreme Court, any 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 step I could have taken, I, I did. Um, I'm getting ready to surrender in the first week of April. So a little bit, about a month, a little bit less, give or take. Um, I'm going to Lompoc camp. So I've heard from many people, you as well, it's, you know, it's, you know, club fed, right? But regardless, though, I, I do want to prepare for it. Um, I spent quite a bit of time in my release plan. I incorporated wherever I think was relevant to it. Um, I spent quite a bit of time on your guys' nonprofit website, kind of an idea what Michael did, Michael didn't do. Um, I didn't exactly copy it, but I took notes from what he put on his plan and I, what I felt was relevant for mine. And then same with the, um, the webinars, because, you know, like, I think it was Chris Maloney, you know, mentioned the importance of it. Um, I think he's the chief probation officer, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and what I would actually do during the webinar is, is I don't, so I don't write after the webinar. I write as I'm listening to the webinar. So as you guys are discussing something or Chris Maloney was saying something, et cetera, I would make notes as he's doing it because an hour later, I may not remember everything he's saying or every, every point that I want. And then if there was something that I was missing, I would, re I would go back and rewatch the video again. But in general, I would write as you know he's speaking, uh, taking notes as he's doing it. And then in that process, after the webinar was done, I'd be able to recollect my thoughts, go through my notes, adjust, do, do what I need to do, and then update it as it go. I, I started this release plan back in November or October, I believe, of last year. So it's about four or five months of process on it. And you know, I, I added things, removed things, I played with it up and down. And then I, you know, I sent it to, to you guys to help me, you know fine tune it. So definitely thank you, Justin, for helping me go through it. Can everyone see the release plan right now, Scott? Do you see the release plan on the screen? Okay. So I want to be clear that we, we have provided resource release plan templates for you to build around it and follow. There are people who have certainly created it on their own. And when we review it, at times it's similar to a sentencing narrative. There are people who say, I'm a great writer, and will say, it's not about great writing. The better writer you are, the better, of course, but it's not about, did you use the best verb? Oh my goodness, I split an infinitive here. That's not relevant. What's relevant is, are you conveying the right message? So earlier this week, Scott Laney and I spoke with someone who is a terrific writer, and we looked at his sentencing narrative, and he said, what do you think? And I said, you're one of the few people who should not turn in anything. You cannot turn, you're one of the few people who should not turn in a narrative because of what you have in here. The only edit should be removing things. We've seen that in some release plans as well, where they, people tend to focus on the past. The, if there are victims, the victims are kind of on the on tangential or on the periphery. That's not really focused on how they're gonna make them whole, continue to get into ideas like I didn't have bad intentions and, and whatnot. So you only create a release plan or a sentencing narrative or create a website and document it through prison if you're going to convey and have the appropriate the message. Okay. And Shai mentioned Chris Maloney. Chris Maloney is the former chief of probation who has said, if he would encourage all of you to share your release plan with your case manager in prison, your prosecutor, why? If it's the right message and you're growing and that prosecutor someday is going to approve or deny you getting off probation early, share it. He suggested you share it with your judge. Why? Your judge sentenced you to prison. All he knows about, all he or she knows about you is your pre-sentence report, bad things that you did. If you're changing the narrative, is it in your interest to share this work? According to the federal chief of probation with whom Michael Santos interviewed, he said yes. He urged you to send it to your probation officer from prison. Why? The first thing your probation officer is going to do is read your probation report. And many of you I know didn't prepare for your probation report. 
You were told it's a 10 minute interview. You were told, don't get your narrative into the probation report. So you're already in a weakened position. Does it help or hurt you if you try to undo bad decisions you've made in the past, either through your own fault or your lawyer encouraged you not to go down this path? Whether you do it or not is up to you. We're going to share the Shy model, the Scott Laney model, the Matt O'Callaghan model, the Kent's model that others follow. And ironically, they tend to get what they want, higher levels of liberty, working for themselves or volunteering while in the halfway house or home confinement and able to travel and have higher levels of liberty on probation. Whether you choose to do it or not, it's up to you. It has to be the right message. Shy, let's go through some basic information you included in, in your re release plan. So sure. you got this information from, from work, working with us. So like the first page, you just wanted to go through some basic identifying information. Is that correct? Like who you are, correct, correct. Through how you created this first page. Correct. So um, this was actually mimicking what Michael did, where I have, you know, very important stuff like my driver license, my social security card, insurance, et cetera. And then I, um, I attach it at the end of it. And this way, it's kind of like a table of contents. So they'll know what's attached, what's not. If they want to flip to it, they can flip to it. Um, I included, this was actually your suggestion. So I didn't have a summary before. Um, so I took your suggestion of adding a summary, um, which is a paragraph you see right now. I included, you know, my car, my license plate, I'm the registered owner. Um, I, you know, included my sentence length, obviously my name, my birthday, you know, that type of information that, you know, will identify me and don't know who, whose reports are reading. So for everyone watching, this is relevant because there, when I was in prison, there were prisoners, we used to be afraid to tell staff that we had a job lined up because there were, and I even filmed a YouTube video on this years ago, like, don't tell staff you have a job. Because if you have a job, you're not going to need as much time in the community. They're going to give it to somebody else. We believe because of the, the First Step Act and an agreement with what we've heard from John Gustin, who ran halfway houses for 20 years, we've interviewed him on three webinars. There's been a shift or change. If there's only 7,000 beds in the halfway house across the country, and if most people who are employed are concerned about their own self-interest, does it make more sense that a case manager will give you more time? If you're stable, because if they give it to someone who's unstable and that person reoffends, it's going to make the case, make the case manager look bad. So I believe the first step back has changed that because they're trying to incentivize excellence. They're trying to reward those who are doing the work and documenting, not telling, but showing. So I like on this first page of the release plan, he's getting right into, here's a letter from my employer. There's work for me waiting on the other side. Many people would be afraid to do this under the idea I have a job, they're not gonna give me as much time. I don't believe that anymore. So he has a letter from his employer that talks about, it. he's aware that he's a convicted felon. He understands that he's in federal prison despite those inconveniences. He is prepared to offer him an employment opportunity. This is something worth sharing. So if you have an opportunity, you should attach that letter from the employer. If you do not, if you do not have a job lined up, something that, I mentioned recently, and I filmed this video I haven't posted yet called How to Get a Shorter Federal Prison Sentence. And someone in our community went to a proffer with their narrative and basically said, no one will hire me, but here's a Google sheet of like 100 places I've looked for work. Literally, Mr. Prosecutor, you can look at the Google sheet of see where I've applied and no one will hire me, but I'm looking for work. I'm not sitting around all day thinking about the life I used to have and waiting for my lawyer to call. I mean, proactive. The U.S. attorney was blown away at the initiative and the effort. So Shy is lucky to have a job lined up. If you don't, just don't write, ain't got no job. Sorry, I'm a convicted felon. No one will hire me. The DOJ ruined my reputation. They took my license. I've seen that in some of the release plans. That's when you should not turn in a release plan. The message should be, support information. You should absolutely use some of the character reference letters you've obtained for sentencing. These are assets. You can edit them. If you go through the release plan workbook that Michael Santos wrote, or if you go through our course or work with our team on it, you will see all of the character reference letters that he has. Why is that relevant? Studies suggest if you have a network and a job and housing, you are less likely to reoffend. That could then mean that you're going to have higher levels of liberty on home confinement or in the halfway house. So absolutely, you can attach your letters or even get creative, update the letters post-sentencing, but continue to get them. If you don't have an, uh, if you do not have a job lined up, make a note in the release plan that you are aggressively seeking work. If not, they're going to think you sit around all day, you're not even trying. Please, this is why every release plan is unique and different, sort of like a sentencing narrative. I do like the summary. 
because let's be realistic. There's a chance they may not read 20 or 30 pages. That's that, that could happen. By the time his release plan is done, this could be 200 pages. So you want to, you know, kind of like your probation interview, you should open up with an immediate acceptance of responsibility if you did it, right? If you did it, if you pled guilty, get it on the record, become a politician, default to your talking points right out of the gate. I'm sorry, I deserve, I, I'll do better. You can hold me accountable. He did that here, a suggestion we made, okay? Transportation, things of that nature. Housing, as I just mentioned, very important. So walk us through this a little bit, uh, Shy. You, you write a little bit about your, your housing situation, but just touch on why you thought that was relevant. Right. So my understanding for home confinement is you, there's certain things you have to, to have. So for example, I mentioned my mother, my girlfriend, and our fish. So they, they know I live there. They support me. It's a single family residence. And I also looked up the crime, the crime rating and it's an A plus. So I don't want them to think that by sending me to home confinement or halfway house home confinement, I'm going to be in an area where it's going to be risky, where I might you know, having issues, but where I live, I'm very fortunate that, you know, as great as A plus, it's very safe. Some people don't even lock their doors at night. Um, I also confirm with Spectrum that we do have a house, a landline installed at the house. And because they have to call that in order to verify that I am home, um, you know, cell phones don't qualify for that. That's why I confirm with Spectrum, we have a landline. I, I confirm with them with the works, you know, I've had it called. Um, I, so I made, made a note of that. So if, if the, the case manager wants to confirm them, I like, guess, you know, it's there. Um, regarding household expenses, like I mentioned that I have a job. Um, my job is aware of my, my criminal conviction, uh, conviction, as when you mentioned earlier, I attached a letter as, as previously stated. Um, and I've been very fortunate that my family and I, we have, you know, enough savings. Um, my girlfriend is also uh, a working professional. She has a master in architecture from UCLA. And she's about to get her MBA in about a few months. So with that, you know, she has a fantastic salary. Thus, you know, expense-wise, they don't have to worry about me trying to do something I shouldn't do to get my get my expenses paid. I've we've already made arrangements for that with my job, my mom, and my girlfriend's um, career and income. And in addition to that, we don't have any mortgage payments till 2024. So my for my, my sentence is, is is much shorter than other people's. But for all all in terms of for my situation, we don't have any expenses at all. And all my my, my car is paid off. Home, home, home has no mortgage. So I wanted to outline this so that they'll know that I don't have to worry about expenses and, and whatnot. I can focus on myself, my re-entry, my, my, my employment, ensure that I keep my employment and I do what I'm supposed to do with my employer. So, and then, so we're going to continue. And I want everyone to know you, you need to use your judgment in creating this. And what, what I mean by that is there are people, we've worked on some plans where Following the sentencing hearing, some judges can say some very difficult things at the sentencing hearing. So Shai did an opening paragraph here. Very good. We encourage someone to do an opening paragraph that literally put the judge's words here. And you may recall the very popular movie with uh, Eminem called Eight Mile, where at the end of the movie, there's this rapper battle scene. And he essentially says to the rapper, like, I am white trash and this and that. All the things his opponent could have said to him, he said. And then the guy drops the mic. The, the point is, if you can put yourself in the shoes of other people and put out there what they're already thinking or what they've said, you advance your agenda. So someone in our community, their release plan was very humble and it was very hard to write. And it basically said, at my sentencing, my judge said this to me, you're a menace to society. You're a career criminal. I do not have any confidence that you will not, that, that you won't return to, that I think you may return to federal prison. I'm calling the marshals in. You're going to be remanded when I sentence you to prison in a few minutes. I feel terrible for your family. There are victims as much as anyone. I don't know what you've been doing for the last three years, but I know you haven't been looking for work. You sure play a lot of video games. What's your rating? I'm insulted by the volunteer work that you do. You think because you post on Facebook once a week that you're some hero change in the world. I'm not impressed, nor am I a buyer. I'm not really convinced that you're remorseful or ashamed. This, 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 and this. And it was humiliating and embarrassing. So she basically opened the release plan by saying, my judge thinks I'm a career criminal and essentially trash. And I'm going to spend the rest of my life trying to change that because that was hard for me to hear. It was hard for my family to hear. So I'm going to embrace what my, my judge told me. And I'm going to begin to build a record around that. On the flip side, many of you have been sentenced by a judge and have been told, I know you'll never break the law again. The only reason I'm going to sentence you to prison is for the deterrence component. And I believe you've made amends and I believe you. So if your judges said things to you, 
that you need to prove worthy of, you should build that into your release plan and then document how you're proving worthy of it. Own what the stakeholders share with you and then begin to create a record that shows why you're different. Because that one person who wrote those very terrible things the judge said to them, then if you build the record over the course of two, three, four, five, six, seven years in prison, and then you share that with your judge from prison one or two or three years from now, you can essentially say, you thought I was scum and a career criminal and I get it because I did bad things. You may not believe me, but here's the record I'm beginning to build. Does that advance your agenda? We think it does. We think it helps you. Now, I liked, I joked with Shai, texted him that I love that he even mentioned like that he lives with two fish, right? We had someone when I was in the halfway house, she wore the halfway house employee, she wore Boston Red Sox gear every day from top to bottom, socks and a hat and a shirt. And a couple of guys got kind of strategic, I think, and they started to wear a Red Sox hat around and somehow, some way <laughs> they got passes approved a little bit more quickly. I'm not encouraging you to manipulate and whatnot, but if you have dogs, if you have things, include some personal information. Is it unrealistic that perhaps a case manager says, oh, you miss your dogs? What type of dogs do you have? I too have dogs. It's okay to be personal, to humanize yourself a bit. But I, I found that frankly kind of funny that he mentioned that, not funny, I would, I text him, I would have written the same thing. I or two fish. You, you never know what they're going to latch on to, shuckle, or want to get engaged in. Okay. I never heard of crimegrade.org. I love that that you mentioned it. You go through expenses, confirm continuing to show that you have you're fortunate to, to have resources. But let's touch on again for the moment of, of your employer. So Shai, you were very upfront with, with your yeah, employer the fact that you're going yeah, to prison. Is that correct? If everyone can mute themselves, please, while we're we're speaking. Thank you. Shai, so you were very upfront with your employer about your upcoming prison term, correct? Correct. Okay. Now, something that all of you are concerned about, there could be medical issues. Yes, the COVID Act is ending in May, but that doesn't mean that people aren't still getting out of prison earlier. Compassionate release, it's always existed, but it, it still exists by way of the First Step Act. So people presume that the COVID and CARES Act is going away, that no one can get released under a compassionate release can be harder. Certainly, we wish it was continuing because it would bring more people home you know, more quickly. But it doesn't change that your release plan should focus extensively on any medical or health issues. So walk us through, Shai. Um, and I think we'd encourage you to be more extensive here and really get it on, on the record, not just you, but your family. So can you touch on, on why you built this into the plan? Right. So um, I really wanted to bring the point about both my mother, my father, and my grandmother's you know, age um, and the medical condition, since I'm, I am their primary caregiver. Uh, you know, my mother had a car accident. Um, you know, she, she can work, but she can't really lift anything. She has to be very careful with her back and her neck. So you know, she's she's fine getting her job done, but anything you know beyond heavy lifting, I take care of. My father as well. He had back surgery. Um, he's recovering much better than he did before. But again, I am his caretaker. My grandma, knock on wood, I mean, she's turning 100. For a 100-year-old, she's doing fantastic. But again, she's turning 100. So she, she has quite a bit of medical conditions that I need to be there to take care of her. Um, I'm currently enrolled at UCLA still as an alumnus taking classes. And my goal, and I'm, I'm allowed to continue taking classes as, as long as I want. Um, so I did outline this and, you know, upon my release, my plan is to continue taking classes. So I want them to know that even though I got my MBA from UCLA, I've continued my relationship with UCLA. I've continued my education with them. Um, and I also got into the, the, the medical aspect of it. For example, I had a CT scan, um, you know, I have a mass in my lungs. I have an impaired lung. I have documented cases of long COVID. Um, and on, on the next page, I, I even quoted, um, the CDC as a source, um, due, due to my, my BMI, um, the, the purpose of it really was to just doc, put, put these medical conditions, you know, documented in it. And I do have my medical records um, uploaded as well. This way, they'll be able to see that, sure, I understand that CARES Act may or not be going away and things are changing. But regardless, having that information there, whether or not they'll use it, I feel like it's better for them to have. And I didn't want to hide any medical conditions, especially because I'm prescribed an inhaler that I need to have. So Part of part of my medication list includes my inhaler from my from my physician, and ideally they're going to allow me to either take it in or they're going to provide me one as per my medication list. And and I wanted to make sure if I if I needed it, I can document it. Like, hey, my release plan mentioned my my long COVID, mentioned my my BMI, mentioned the mass in my lungs and my impaired lung. 
Um, and then I also want to bring up my, my medical insurance. So for example, if I'm, you know, in the custody of BOP, they have to, for the most part, you know, cover my health insurance, but anything on home confinement or afterwards, it's on myself. And I want to outline that I do have Blue Shield PPO for medical, mental, and, and dental. So everything is already covered. Um, and then I also go back into a little bit more detail about my family's situation, how they have responded. My family has been very supportive, especially my girlfriend, my mother, um, you know, we, we, we all live together in, in our house, um, regarding substance abuse. I don't have any, um, but I did want to outline that if I did, I would take advantage of the RDAP program. Uh, however, since I, my PSR mentions, I've, I don't have any abuse and I've actually never used drugs in my entire life. Um, I wouldn't qualify for it, but of course I think RDAP is a fantastic program for those who, you know, who do need it. So of course, if I needed it, I would outline how I would take advantage of it. So l- let's cover that as far. So we've covered work health, uh, a summary, uh, living situation. I love the idea of referencing the the CDC data. To the extent that you can include references and evidence, it really helps you. For example, last month, we had two separate people in our community request extensions of their surrender. One had evidence from a doctor, the other did not. The one who had evidence, a letter from a doctor, got the extension request uh, approved. The other who did not, have the letter, did not. So you're dealing with judges and case managers who might be very cynical and they expect you to say something. So to the extent that you can document it, it helps. Even with the, many of you were not prepared for your probation report and you didn't get into your background and lessons learned and substance abuse and medical issues. And many of you regret that. And if you've been sentenced, it's very difficult to change that. I can't tell you that your release plan will totally correct the record, but does it help you if, for example, your substance abuse isn't thoroughly disclosed in your probation report where you can articulate, I do have a history of substance abuse here. It's documented. I'm continuing to go to a a counselor at my own expense. And here's a letter from that counselor. It's evidence, right? A number of people surrendered to prison. They say, I need treatment. Judge recommended RDAP and a drug coordinator can say, sure, I see it, but you've been home for two years. You didn't get treatment then. Suddenly you're in prison. You want treatment? How ironic. You want the year off your sentence for RDAP, right? And you might be thinking, but it's in my PSR. The judge recommended it. I've seen the law. I'm eligible. I got four-year sentence. True. And you may still get into the program, but it could be harder for you. And in a separate course with Scott and Matt, we're going to discuss the RDAP program and how people get thrown out and held back. The point is, If there's any weakness in your PSR, or even if it's strong, continue to build the record and document it by way of this release plan. It really helps if you have letters from doctors. It really helps if you have letters from a substance abuse counselor. And by the way, I'm not talking about one paragraph that says, I saw Joe Smith on a Tuesday afternoon for 30 minutes and he has a problem and he should get treatment. Don't do that. You're going to look foolish. So will the counselor. You should have an assessment done. You should go to counseling. There should be a history, and it's something you should be prepared to share. Drug coordinators, they're they're not dumb. They're smart, and they know when they're being played. One or two paragraphs with someone you saw one time, uh, it doesn't count. As we continue through the release plan, clearly, Shai, you you touch on your, uh, we've covered your education a little bit, employment, some of your skills. Of course, this is this is you know very important. It's good for case managers to know. But this is also relevant to articulate your skills because there's a chance some of you could teach a course in prison, right? So I've discussed with Shai for the little time that he's at Lompoc teaching this release plan course. We heard from Ryan last week, whose case manager at Thompson said, you should teach this course. We're hearing this from case managers across the country. So Shai, is this something that potentially interests you? You've documented yeah. it, potentially yeah. teaching this class to people? Yeah, I mean, I actually used to be a teacher, so I do have some experience uh, teaching. So so all of you should consider that. Put your skills in here. And even if it's not your job, you can you can go to education and try to teach it. And as I discussed with Shai, does it help or hurt you if you build into your release plan that you're teaching in prison, that you're inspiring and trying to give back to people in prison? We're of the opinion that it absolutely that it absolutely helps you. Okay, so we're covering job skills. We're only on page five. Now, this is something that I know Shai has spent a lot of time on, and this is why a release plan can go from 20 pages to 200 pages. Walk us through this book list, how you came up with it, and what you plan to do with the books that you read. Because anyone, if you're going to prison, you have to create a release plan. If you want to be prepared for the other side, this is something that is very impressive to probation officers. So walk us through this book list. 
So I put together a list of books that um, I felt would be most beneficial for my future. Um, I outlined uh, as my skills with negotiation, networking, entrepreneurship. So I focus a lot on books similar to that, such as, you know, Earn Like and Get as a Success, um, Simon Sinek, Start With Why, it's just, you know, books regarding leadership, regarding skills that um, I believe I have, but I, I want to hone in on. And then one thing I, I noted in my release plan is to be able to actually do book reports, because if you can read a book and you don't remember it, then why did you even read it? So one thing I've, I've you know, when I was in high school, I, I I complained about making book reports, but as I grew older, I realized that making book reports, you actually remember them because I still remember those books from high school because I wrote about them. Um, and that's why my goal is, you know, during, during my time having these books, not only reading them, but also writing about them, taking notes, just like after the webinars, you know, during the webinars, I'm, I'm taking notes. And after I'm taking notes, same with while I'm reading the books, you know, I'll take notes as I'm reading them, um, you know, I'll write down whatever goes through my mind, I'll be able to document it in my book report. And that way, the whoever released, released my release plan will know that I didn't just BS about reading the books. I really did read the books and I wrote about it. So I encourage all of you to, to do the same exact thing. Michael did it through 26 years in prison. That's why he has a, a wealth of knowledge. And it's something that I did as well. And it really helped me. So I, I was going to put up, try to share my screen to give you an example of one way. Let me see. I'll give you an example of one way that I did it while I was in prison. There's a book I read. Can you see my screen? Why good people do bad things. Can you see that, Scott? There was a book I read in prison I really liked. And what I would do, there wasn't even email when I was in prison. So I would handwrite it, send it home, and my mom would send it back to me. Now with Corlings, you don't even have to do that. So I remember reading this book in prison, Why People Do Good, Why Good People Do Bad Things. Why, why did I read it? Because I wanted to build a career in partisan ethics speaker on compliance and whatnot. So I can tell you, a lot of my initial talks were like verbatim things I read in this book, Warren Buffett. It takes 20 years to build a reputation, five minutes to ruin it. Without addressing our shortfalls, we leave ourselves vulnerable to pressures that could tear our lives apart. These are all things I've mentioned in compliance talks from five people to 15,000 people over the last 14 years, and I still refer to it. I have this for 100 books. So it's of no use to read a book if you can't recite it, but rather to document it and share it. Until this day, I continue to use things I read about in this book, and then I build it in to my own story. It was Steve Jobs that said, good leaders steal ideas, copy ideas, great leaders steal ideas. Everything we say, everything you've shared or read, anything Tony Robbins, Mark Manson, they say it all the time. It's come from somebody else. They put it into their own voice, their own experience. Do the same exact thing. Just don't read books and have an inability to recite or re remember them. Then you're just truly wasting time. So we have the book list, why did you read it? What did you learn from it? How will it help you upon your release? We have someone in prison right now who was told by a friend of his it's very corny and foolish and like out of second grade to, to send a, a book report to a probation officer. Thankfully, he essentially said, I'm going to go down my own path. Thank you. Uh, mind your own business. You know, have a nice day. Do your own thing. Be corny. If it be cheesy, who cares? Just share it. Share it, build it, grow it, document it. What's the downside? They don't read it. What, what's the, what you're in prison? You've lost so much. You're recalibrating. You're starting over. Do creative and new things. Who cares? Just do it. Please, it will help you. Now we get into things that clearly came from the from the book and things that we worked on. Shai, talk a little bit about your, your accountability plan. I love that you included this in here. Describe ways that you've introspected on risk factors. This ties directly into what case managers and people in prison want to know how and yeah. why you're not going to return so how did you come up with this so i actually um mimicked a lot of what michael said um i i took his template i took it from his his uh, nonprofit website and then i applied it to to my life you know right one thing i have that i think has limited my success is i don't always ask for for help and i try to do a lot of things myself so that 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 is an issue now, how, how am i going to address that and I wanted to go into that, like, look, I, I recognize that this has been an issue. I, I don't do it all the time. So I'm going to begin asking my friends and family for more support. And I've, you know, through, through this experience, you know, I have a better understanding that a team is always better than an individual. So even though if I don't always want to ask for help and I always try to do something myself, I've, you know, come to realize that teamwork is better than individual work. And the way my, my brain works and my mind process of things is that if it makes sense to do something better, do it that way. So this is, this is kind of my action plan. And, 
you know, I've been networking through UCLA and I want to continue networking and learning from my UCLA network, as well as the coworkers at my new job. I want to basically keep myself accountable. I mean, people at my job know about my conviction. And if I end up, you know, not following through what I said, it's, it's, it's going to be detrimental to me. And the pressure of wanting to do, to prove them, you know, that, you know, I can do it. I can do what I've said and be worthy of them, them accepting me, even with all my flaws, it will, you know, push me to, to not only hold myself accountable for myself, but also hold myself accountable for them. Um, that's, that's where I got into the re-entry um, accountability plan. So the, the value of the interviews with subject matter experts is they're giving you their perspective. And one thing we repeatedly hear from judges, probation officers, U.S. attorneys, they feel they are told exactly what they want to hear. Even you may write something that is exactly what they may want to read. So a good probation report should be honest. Your sentencing narrative should be honest, including any flaws and you know, everything, the good and bad. The reason that's valuable, he's honest here. Not always asking for help limits my success. The more vulnerable, the more open and honest you can be, then you can let staff know and they may give you suggestions on how to improve. Judge Boone, in an interview with Michael Santos, said he's more inclined to believe an offender Here's the story. Judge Boo said, someone came into my courtroom. They said, yes, I sold drugs or something like that. It's like a 10-year mandatory minimum. And the judge said, here's someone admitting they're, they're going to prison for a long time. But then they said, but I didn't have a gun, Your Honor. And he's like, you know what? I'm more inclined to believe the guy didn't have a gun because he just admitted to this other federal crime that's going to send him to prison for a while. That's better than a blanket denial or excusing or I didn't do it. I didn't have bad intentions. They don't appreciate that. So we encourage you as you build out your release plan, whether you do it with us or on your own, be vulnerable and share mistakes and details throughout your life. We're working with someone who is building into the real release plan. Um, he said, I'm just a total people pleaser. Like it's my whole life. I'm afraid to say no. I want to say no but I don't. And I say yes, even when I know that it could hurt me because I don't want to disappoint. I have this disease to please. You know what book is in his release plan? A book called Disease to Please. So he can overcome this tendency. Why? If he can show that he's overcome it and he's building, much like if you can show you're no longer substance or alcohol you're not using, are you more likely to have higher levels of liberty? Without question, someone built into the release plan, they were a degenerate gambler for 10 years but now I'm getting healthier and better and Gamblers Anonymous. And here's a letter from my counselor. That probation officer will be more inclined to think the person isn't going to continue to gamble. So our point is the good and the bad, you've got to build it into the plan as, as Shai did here, not asking for help. It could be as little or as much as you like, but the more you share, it's kind of an inverted process. The more you share, the more you sh the more it's going to help you. And I know it's hard to open up to our failures and mistakes, but the more you can do it, the, the better. Then they can help you or you know how to help yourself. So I, I, I knew you got that from, from our work and I thought that was important. Okay, now we have photos, right? Many people will do a sentencing video, for example, or they may do photos and build it into a sentencing memorandum. It really brings things to life. Shai, so can you uh, talk a little bit about how you came up with the idea to include yeah. these, these photos and whatnot? So it was actually Justin's suggestion about putting a photo in, and I decided on this particular photo because my whole family is there. My mother's and my brother's and my father's and my girlfriend's there. So all of us are in one photo together, and it's from my UCLA graduation. Um, and for me, this was a, a very important pivoting moment in my life. If, hey, I can do it, because it was, it was not easy to get an MBA. It was not easy to get accepted to the MBA program. And being able to accomplish that has really helped drive me and make me understand that, look, Things may not always go your way, but as long as you keep working hard and keep pushing through, you'll be able to figure it out. And that's a big reason why I picked this particular photo, because I have my friend, my, my, my family there, their support there and my accomplishment. That's right. And it's just great. It's great to see it. He's written extensively in the release plan about his family support. But I also there's someone I know on this webinar with whom I spoke a few days ago that said, I have no support. My conviction has cost me everything. I don't see my children. And I feel isolated and I'm going through the hardest time of my life, but I want to do better. What should I do? Write about it. Talk about how your bad decisions cost you your family and you're going to prison and you don't know how right now how you're going to rebuild. Be honest, be vulnerable, share it. If you don't have a family or you've got to talk about how you're going to get them back, be honest, build that into the release plan. Why? Because that's going to carry you through your day in prison. I don't ever want, if any of you say that you're bored in prison, we have failed you. 
Now, I know all of this, you get this for the low, low price of free. <laughs> so, but still, if you send a message that says, I'm bored, we have failed you. I'm counting calendar pages. I'm waiting for mail call. Uh, email went down today. I'm freaked out. Uh, what do I do? We have failed you. Don't wish for this experience to be over. Wish for it to be better by working. Because if you don't, it's like a life sentence. Who cares if you serve 18 months or two years or three years if you're not ready? Who cares? We get that all the time. I've been home from prison for how long? 13 years. What have you been doing? Nothing. My DOJ release is still up. No one will hire me. My life is ruined. You've been home for 13 years. You only served six months. What have you been doing? Then you trace back to what they did in prison. They flushed it down the toilet. So the reason this is so valuable is we're going to know whether Shai is accountable or not. He's either going to write the book reports or he is not. He's either going to be authentic or he is not. We encourage you to, to, to build it. Also, certainly create your resume. And he should build into the resume. I'd encourage him to build into the resume today that he helped lead a reentry class, a release plan workshop to inspire justice-impacted people to not just watch a webinar, but to create it and work. It's part of his resume. He'll come home and should teach it at the courthouse like I did. You need to be developing assets and getting ready to, to share them. Now, Shai, as we wrap up, wrap this up, I noticed you did include character reference letters. Is is, is that is, were these your sentencing letters, or did you get so, some updated? No, um, I actually had a, a letter written by my mother as my primary support. Um, I wasn't sure about. I was actually going to ask because I have fifty five character letters for, for my sentencing, and I was going to include all fifty five, but I don't know if that was too much or not. So I only included one for my mother for now, which is so a I more would, recent one. So let me come back to what Judge Bullware told us at a sentencing conference, here's the order of mitigation. One defendant, two lawyer, three friends and family. He then said a lot of defendants get it backwards. They rely on the lawyer, friends and family and the defendants third. Now that's more important even post-sentencing because lawyers aren't even, aren't even involved in the post-sentencing process, right? If you're gonna file an administrative remedy or issues like that in prison, your lawyer's not even, uh, your lawyer's not even involved. So to the point of 55 letters, that's kind of relying on number three, friends and family. So I think including a few letters is a good idea. What's most relevant is, like, are you building your assets? You're, you're doing the work. So if you're going through a first step, first step Act program, just I attended this program, great, I'm going to get my 15 days a month. You can do that. Does it advance your agenda if you submit to your case manager why you went through it, how it helped you, why it will never help you, re why it will ensure you don't reoffend, and give credit to your case manager for encouraging them, to, they encourage you to do it. We encourage you to, to, to do that every step of the way. So a few letters is fine, Shy, but you've got to do the lion's share of the work. I spoke with someone yesterday before I want to, we're going to transition to Lauren in just a moment. Good to see you, Lauren. Thank you. We're going to, I spoke with someone yesterday who said, Hey, or it was a few days ago. I want to hire Michael Santos to write a book. I said, Michael's not writing books right now. I'm sorry. He's busy doing the advocacy work in the prisons and jails. He's not available right now. It's too much time. He's not going to do it. He's like, well, what do I do? I said, can you write 500 words a day? Can you write 300 words a day? He's like, yeah, I can. He's like, well, I'm not a great writer. I'm like, well, can you talk into your iPhone for four minutes and then export it to yourself? He's like, I can do that. So I said, why don't we do a test? Why don't you talk 500 words into your iPhone a day for 30 days? How many words is that? He's like, I don't know, 15,000 words. I said, great. I said, lessons from prison, my book, or a lot of the books that Michael wrote are 50, 100,000 words. This is lessons from prison. It's a 50,000 word book. So I said, if you talk into your iPhone, something to value 500 words, today for 30 days, you have your own book. You don't need to pay someone to write it. You're creating it yourself. Mr. Carper, his son, Scott, has already written a book from Leavenworth. He can publish that into a book, an ebook. Give it away. If you want to become a marketer or entrepreneur, you can give that away to people. You don't, you just need to, to spend some time on it every single day. To that end, Shai, thank you so much for contributing your, your today to, to your release plan. I love that you did it. You take action on every webinar you do it. So I really applaud you for doing that. And we look forward to seeing this 18 page document grow to 180 pages. You'll have your own book by the time it's all said and done. To that, thank you. We're going to spend a few minutes now with, with Lauren. Lauren, if you would unmute yourself. Hi, Lauren. Hi, how are you? Good. So good to see you. Can you give us a few minutes about your experience and where you are in the process? And then I want to talk a little bit about the video you did with Michael. 
Sure. About a month ago, I pled guilty to three federal charges in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, back about a year ago, March 1st of 22, my attorney was notified that I was under a federal investigation. And that stemmed from a state charge from a previous employer. So while I had self-confessed to a crime with my employer and I had been making restitution payments, he wasn't satisfied with the amount of progress I was making and decided to, to go the legal route to pursue me. So I went from a state charge where I lost my career at the time in commercial real estate. And then I was investigated federally. Um, ultimately, I've had three proper sessions. I was charged, had a plea agreement, pled guilty, and now I'm awaiting sentencing. You explained that well. Thank you. <laughs> and I know you've been, I know you've been incredibly proactive. There are some people while going through a criminal charge, kind of like I wanted to hide under a rock and, and not talk about it. It's humbling, it's embarrassing, it can be humiliating. Though some people, and I hope our community plays a role in that, wants to learn from it, talk about it, educate others. You're not in prison yet, so we'd like to say, so let's not act like we're in prison. So to that end, and I put a link up for everyone to see, you, you shared your story with, with Michael. Can you talk with me about that process of, of wanting to speak openly with Michael about how you personally are recalibrating after a criminal charge? Was it cathartic to, to speak openly about it? I would just love to, we'd all love to learn from you and, and why you d decided to contribute your, your time to the nonprofit. Sure. And in full transparency, it was uh, terrifying to yeah. discuss the situation openly, especially knowing that it was being recorded, you know, yeah. because when you say something, then it's out there and there's no taking that back. Um, but I think for myself, because I have been in therapy for over three years, I've spent over 200 hours in therapy sessions trying to figure out what the root is that caused this initial illegal activity. Um, part of it is a, a childhood trauma. Part of it is that I was in a very abusive relationship at that time. But understanding the why for me is very important because if I don't know who I am at the core, then I cannot make choices to change those decisions I've made in the future. And there is a significant time period for me in therapy where my therapist was uh, discussing the mountain in front of all of us. And sometimes you're at different stages in the past. You may be in an investigative stage. You may be in prison. You may be facing the loss of your family or your freedom imminently or historically. And what I realized is that when we look at the mountain, you have to look at the step in front of you. And sometimes removing that mountain from your perspective and just focusing on the next step and determining whether or not that takes you closer to the person you want to be, then it makes it palatable and you can actually address what's right in front of you and in your control. So these are things, there, there's myriad ways that you can follow Lauren's lead. You can, I mean, we've, we cover them every week. There are people who have a website who do a video. Some people, I don't want that. Fine. There are some people like Mr. Carper's son, Scott, has a newsletter that grows every single week that, that contributed to our webinar today. There are some people every week in prison, they just send an, an email to their family via core links. There are so many ways you can share lessons learned, but you've got to document it because at some point, Lauren's going to want to share this video with people, with, with a probation officer. It's a huge part of her release plan, that's an hour video, which probably tells me there are thousands of words there. Well, what can you do with those words? You can get them transcribed at rev.com for, a, I don't know, it's like a dollar a minute to get it transcribed. And just like that, she's got several thousand words she can build into an article. She can begin to share. Do, the, do those things align with what interests you, Lauren, and beginning to try to change the narrative about your story and inspire others who are going through this process? Absolutely. I was uh, very shocked that in Tulsa, Oklahoma, my case made it to the Tulsa world. And when you read the perspective of an editor or a public media outlet on your personal story, 
there's not uh, the context that I want to be out there. You know, people that I associate with in our business, family members that have read this, and I want the narrative to be full perspective. I want the other side of the story to be told, which is the why. What what is the reason behind it, and and what is it going to look like going forward for me? And and I think that that's important not only for myself but for the victims that are involved in this and for my children and my family and my business associates. Because if I don't show a change in perspective or that I see what was wrong with my choices, then they cannot be assured that I won't return and make those choices again. So the the value of documenting the journey is you establish it, you memorialize it, and then in time you're going to feel differently and, and you should. I mentioned someone in our community recently, well, we did a video with her, Jennifer Shaw. She went to prison for six and a half years to Brian. And I, the, my final piece of advice to her was write five minutes a day, like every day. And because the day that you surrender in Brian, for example, you're not, you don't go in with your family. The guards come out to the car, they get you and they say, okay, you've got to go now. So they walk you from the car, they take you inside versus a lot of prisons where you can walk in with the family. I said, I want you to write about them taking you out of the car in the strip search, because three days later, you're not going to see it as significantly as you do as it's happening. So you've got to memorialize it. I joke that there are things earlier than the newsletter I sent out, I referenced a blog from March 2009, 14 years, 13, 14 years ago today. I go back through some of those blogs in prison. I'm embarrassed at what I wrote. Uh, but that's how I felt at that moment. And I can look back and laugh and think, how did I write that? But nobody cares. Nobody's reading it. But that's how I felt at that moment. But if you don't memorialize it as it's as it's happening, and then you try to recreate it, you never can. It, it's always going to feel differently. Scott, had you come home and tried to recreate your life in federal prison now that you're home, would that have ever worked? Or would, don't you see it differently now? It It could not have been possible. We had one day in South Dakota where we were thrown into quarantine, I think it was my second or third time in quarantine. And I remember I was infuriated over it. And I, I kept a journal of each day, how I felt about the experience and what was happening. And it was just astounding how different I felt when it was over from when it started. So had I tried to recapture all that after the fact, um, I think it would not have been, been accurate. It wouldn't have done justice to the experience. So Lauren should do several videos, whether it's with us or or her own, because clearly she's articulate, can carry a message, engaging. Well, that's a strength. What do we talk about through our work? Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. There are people who will say to me, I'm not a good writer. Well, you're a good communicator, right? There are CEOs who can't put three sentences together because they're delegating work. Great. Fine. Talk. If you're a better writer, write it out. But if you're not doing it, you're as Michael likes to say, it's kind of happy talk. Shy did the work. He says he's take notes during the webinar. He implements it. It's of no value if you don't do that work. But we encourage you to memorialize it. Kent's on our team, potentially getting ready to go to prison here soon. He's done a release plan with our team. The second Kent was sentenced. What did you do the second you left the the, the courthouse, Kent? What's the first thing you did? Recorded a video. (laughs) Right. If you tried to film that video now, do you think it would be as authentic and and vulnerable? What what would it be like today? Oh, nowhere near the same. Nowhere near the same. It was to remember how it felt to hear the judge talk about all the work that I had done and kind of recapping it all with such, it sounds silly to say it, but it's, I'm talking to a community of people that can relate to it. It's, it was such a win to get 15 months versus the 40 to 50 I was expecting. So to, put it into a video and then knowing that there was going to be a point in my life, whether it's going to be shared to my, and really it's to my kids, myself, anybody. I mean, I haven't really put made it public necessarily, but, um, but with this community I have, and I don't think it would have translated at all. So that's a good takeaway. Your, your release plan doesn't just have to be words. You can build in as shy did links, please, Mr. Probation officer. It doesn't have to be on YouTube. It could be on Vimeo. It could be anywhere. It doesn't have to be public for the world to see, but there's such value in memorializing this because if you don't, and this is how I want to wrap it up before I answer some questions. Again, what Chris Maloney said, if you don't change the narrative and build the release plan and document how you've changed, what you've learned, where you're going, why you'll never reoffend, and why you're not, they're just going to default to the probation report, which has the worst decisions you've ever made in your life. You've got to work to change that, that narrative. 
and the release plan is the way is the way to do it. There are some questions coming in. Someone left a message yesterday about should they pay fines and forfeiture and whatnot before they go in. Restitution is a topic that continues to come up. We're going to address it. Here's my approach. You've been sentenced to prison. If they're not requiring you to forfeit and turn over that money, or if you have restitution and you're going to make payments in prison, I would encourage you, you want to make sure your family has resources and you're able to live if you're going to prison. And so to the extent, if you if you have the resources to pay it all back and get it off your back, you, you should. But if it's a situation, if they're not requiring you to pay it, and it's a situation between your family being homeless and whatnot, or you not being able to have $50 a month coming into the commissary, then I would encourage you to make minimum payments, build the release plan, make the payments in prison. But really, you may need some of those resources to rebuild when you come home. So I'd be very careful about turning over every last penny unless you're required to, because it can really lead to problems on the inside. You're going to do, you'll do the minimum and you'll pay as much as you can, but it shouldn't be to the detriment of your family having little to no resources, especially if you've already been sentenced to prison. I mean, there are people who turn over every last penny before sentencing, thinking it's going to keep them out of jail. It doesn't. So I know you, if you've pled guilty and you created victims, you want to make amends, but it's harder to make amends and pay them back if you have nothing yourself to grow and rebuild. I want to encourage all of you to be cautious about turning over resources to, to the government. Someone asked, my husband is waiting to be transferred from jail to prison during sentencing. His lawyer asked the judge to recommend he be transferred close to me, his wife. He wants to make sure he goes to a camp or low security holding. Can we do anything to influence it? First off, according to what judges have told us, they shouldn't ask for a prison closest to you. They should ask for a specific prison. So Sheila, did that happen? Did they ask for the prison closest to you or did, they, did the judge ask for a specific prison? If Sheila's not here, well, I don't know if she's still here. I think she is. Here's what we suggest. You ask for a specific prison. Why? I can tell you. There are people in Los Angeles who have gotten like, this could have happened to Shy, who only got a six month sentence. There are people in Los Angeles who got short sentences. The lawyer asked for the closest prison to their home and the BOP has designated them to the Metropolitan Detention Center in downtown Los Angeles. And they reach out to the BOP and the BOP says, uh, we gave you what you want. It's the closest prison to his release address. And of course, everyone's thinking, I thought he was going to go to a minimum security camp. So you want to be very specific. Don't ask for the closest prison. Don't ask for two prisons. Don't ask, ask for a specific prison. With respect to wants to make sure he goes to a camp or low security holding, of course, the Bureau of Prisons in Grand Prairie will ultimately make the designation based heavily on the pre-sentence report. So you should know by now if he's pled guilty, he's already been sentenced. So yeah, the, yes. Yeah. So you have the probation report. He's an American citizen. If it's nonviolent, um, 10 years or less, no outstanding state cases, then he should be eligible for a minimum security camp. But again, you don't want to ask for a low or a camp. It does no good to ask for a low if you're a camper. That happened, so, someone did that recently and like the, in our community. And we told the lawyer what to do and the lawyer didn't do it. Here's the example. Someone in our community was sentenced to four years in federal prison. I told the lawyer, do not ask for Lompoc. He said, well, Lompoc has the drug, drug program. I said, they have it in the low, not the camp. He said, well, we'll just ask for the low. They have the drug program. I said, it doesn't work that way. So he asked the judge. The judge is like, I'm happy to recommend it. It's up to the BOP. And he ends up getting, of course, he doesn't get designated to the low. He gets designated to a camp that doesn't have the drug program. And now we're trying to undo all of these bad decisions in part because the lawyer asked for a low. It's a waste. I don't want you to do that. So you should know by now if he's camp or low eligible and the lawyer should ask for a specific prison. Regarding Sheila, the transfer process, a lot of he should be documenting why he's, he wants to go to this prison, why that prison may have a specific program that would help him. So, for example, we have someone in the detention center in Miami who has a history. He has a, a judge, Demetriolis, in Florida who remands everyone at sentencing. So he's been in the detention center. He's building into his release plan his history of substance abuse or alcohol. That history in the release plan has the letter from the physician. So he's asking to go to Pensacola, which has RDAP, and he's sharing that with the case manager. You've got to be your own best advocate, and the PSR should help. So he should be building the release plan, sharing it with his case manager, and making a case on why he should go to the prison of his choosing, 
hopefully within 500 miles of your home, which is something the BOP tries to do by way of the first step back. He's got- Do we give, back. sorry, do we give that uh, letter to his lawyer to give to the judge or how do we go would, about doing when, that? When was he sentenced? Uh, just March 1st last week. So there's actually a window after sentencing to make changes. Where was he sentenced and what, what district? Um, in San Francisco. San um, Francisco. Curiously, yeah. who's his, who his judge? Uh, Breyer, Judge Breyer. Oh, we have a great history with Judge Breyer. He is a he is awesome. A, he is a crack up, and not always nice. That much I can tell you. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. That was he can be a Judge Breyer. His brother's on the Supreme Court. Yes, yeah. We did a little research. <laughs> yeah, his he sentenced a good friend of Michael Santos as Gregory Reyes. Greg was the CEO of Brocade Communications. Um, okay. Anyway, so what I would do is ask the I would ask the lawyer to ask the judge to make a specific recommendation because in Northern California there are myriad prisons, right? There's Atwater, there's Mendota, there's Herlong. So what I so would the do is, yep. his lawyer did ask during sentencing if he can be sent somewhere close to me, um, and the and the judge just said that he would recommend it, but sure. nothing specific was I, said. I, Amy, so good to see you. I would get a specific, based on what we've learned from sentencing judges, again, what we're conveying to you comes from judges and what we've learned. They mm -hmm. suggest you ask for a specific prison. That's very vague. Okay. Right? Okay. The, the county jail and the, 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 the holding center could be the closest one. I would say, we, your honor, we respectfully request that you des recommend Mendota, Atwater, wherever it may be, and get that on the record. But federal judges have told us that you should ask for a specific prison. And okay, and reason, we can, and our, and we'll have to have right? our lawyer, we'll have to have our lawyer request for that. Yeah, it's not like it's a new, I would, it's not like it's a sentencing hearing, have the paralegal create it and send it. It's not like a, a hearing, it's just something the judge may approve or, or deny, but you have a window following sentencing. In our experience, if you ask the judge for a certain surrender date, a recommendation of programs, it buoys your chances. No guarantee you'll get it, but it increases your, your your chances that you will. So again, I share the story, the closest prison to your home, it might not be the most desirable one. And the BOP could say, we gave you what you want. Stop complaining. What's the downside in being specific? None, zero. It's part of the reason we educate and train lawyers all across the country on mitigation, because they're not involved in the post-sentencing process and there can be consequences. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're you're very welcome. Someone asked about. I see someone's hand up. Talk to me, Goose, in the top left. Steve, nice to see you. Hi. How are you? I'm well. Thanks for joining our community. Thank you. Um. So, my question is. We just went to our guilty plea. Well, we changed our plea two days ago, and and now we are on record with a guilty plea. So our next steps are in process. I have spoken with my lawyer and I'm like, I need to work on my allocution statement. I need to work on my release plan. I need to work on my personal narrative. And she keeps telling me, slow down, slow down. You don't need to worry about that. You don't need to do that right now. But in the same breath, well, maybe not the same breath, but she says we are doing time, no matter what. Both of our attorneys have said we're doing time. We're going to get time. Originally, we were hoping that maybe we would just get probation, house arrest, something. But according to our lawyers, we have all this coming our way. But they're telling us to quit worrying about the things that we're learning from you, Michael, the websites. I did a webinar with Michael the week, uh, like two or three weeks ago. Um, and so I'm wondering why my lawyer's telling me to pump the brakes, but I mean, obviously I can see why I wanna follow what you guys are telling me. So I, I have some thoughts and after I answer, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna let Kent jump in and offer some insights. Okay. And Scott Laney can as well. So I have said before, I was kind of a cynical, I was kind of a cynical defendant. I was vulnerable and kind of easy to exploit. So like if someone said they could help me, I'm like, oh, here's the credit card. <laughs> but there's very little deliverable from it. I was scared to go to prison. And 
of course, we know the power of advocacy of working to change the narrative. So what I'm conveying to you, if you if someone is cynical, whether they pay us or they use our free resources, I'm conveying to you, Scott, can you put up the links to the, the video with Judge Boo and Judge Bennett from our YouTube channel? What I'm conveying to you, we're just channeling what we've learned from federal judges. I've attended a thousand sentencing hearings. We've interviewed myriad judges. Two of them have the courage to come on our YouTube channel. I've spoken with them on stage, including Judge Pearson and, and others. We're channeling what they say defendants should do. Whether you do it or not is, is certainly up, is up to you. A number of lawyers will say it's too early. And I have jokingly said it wasn't too early to get indicted for the DOJ to issue a press release for you to lose your career and your reputation. It wasn't too early to scratch a big retainer check to the law firm. It's not too early for the lawyer to, for the US attorney to begin preparing for your sentencing hearing. It's not too early for the probation officer to begin preparing for your probation interview and the eventual report. So the FBI agent that arrested me, Paul Bertrand, who is now a friend, said on a video, he said, when we show up at your home, we're already in the bottom of the eighth inning. Defendants mistakenly believe this thing is just starting. The way they're going to get the best outcome is by way of their own mitigation and what they do to change the narrative. So you know what to do, whether we help, whether you get on the phone with us later and say, help me with the narrative, help me with the PSR prep, or you use our free resources, regardless, we're conveying to you lessons and advice directly from federal judges, including Judge Boone, a YouTube video who said, no disrespect to lawyers, one to 2% of what influences me at a sentencing hearing comes from the lawyer. Why? The lawyer's paid to say it. I've got to discount that. I need to hear from the defendant what you've learned. So before I turn it over to Ken to talk about his preparations over several years, earlier in the webinar, I mentioned our client who went to a proffer session who told the U.S. attorney, here's my narrative. No one will hire me, but here's 100 places I've looked for work. I'm really trying to change the narrative. I'm trying to earn money as a law-abiding citizen. I'm not sitting at home playing Tetris all day. I'm really trying. Please. That begins to change the narrative. If you can go to a probation interview and say, this is what I'm doing to make amends. This is what I'm learning. This is why I'll never return. Based on what we've learned from federal judges, that's how you advance your agenda, advance your opportunity to get more leniency at sentencing, get out of prison earlier. And you've got to use and exercise your own judgment. We have had people in our community sit in their lawyer's office and say, did you know Mark Bennett, this judge has sentenced more than 4,000 defendants? Why are we not doing what Judge Bennett just told us we should do? Why am I not going to my probation interview with my personal narrative, knowing this personal narrative can influence the recommendation the probation officer makes, knowing my judge may call upon this probation officer at my sentencing hearing, tell me again why we're not getting the narrative to the probation officer? I don't understand. If you can ask those questions and hold them accountable, the game changes. Yes, back to you. So I found um, the pre-interview questions, and it was out of Texas, but it was just very basic information. It was, um, and I would suggest anybody else Google that. And my thought is, I don't want to waste time in my uh, probation interview trying to figure out where I lived when I was nine years old, right? Yeah. Because they want that entire address history. They want to know where my brother lives that I haven't spoken to in years. Um, so I can pre-get that information and not waste my time trying to gather that while I'm sitting in that room. And that's what I've learned from listening to podcasts and YouTube videos and everything from, from you guys. So I made a Google Drive that I share with my lawyer, my husband and his lawyer, and you know, it all is through Google. And I've been uploading documents and they keep telling me, why do you keep sending all this stuff? Am I doing something wrong? So or do you're, 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 doing every, you're doing everything correctly. What you're doing is you're building and documenting a record. Now there's, you have to understand it's foreign to some lawyers to the degree that defendants should mitigate. And this comes directly Again, from judges we have interviewed, you've got to change the narrative. You've got to advocate and do the work. You've got to build and grow. We have people going to probation interviews with their release plan in addition to their sentencing narrative. Many lawyers feel I've been hired. I have this covered. I'm a former U.S. attorney. There's nothing you need to do, even though judges have told us they discount that work. So it requires 
it's there's this idea of like pain and regret myriad people go through the system they go to prison and they regret over how they prepared for sentencing rather than deal with a little bit of short-term pain and hold the lawyer they hired accountable have some tough conversations deal with some short-term pain of holding the lawyer accountable saying i accept if it's the right message if the narrative is the right message if your release plan is the right message tell your lawyer i accept full responsibility for this but this is a message i want to convey to my probation officer what I've learned, why I'm worthy of leniency, why I'll never return to another courtroom. You're paid to say it. And if you don't believe it, here's a video of the federal judge that they discounted. It was a federal judge, Judge Pearson in Ohio, that said, if he is a bad dad, the lawyer's paid to say he's a good dad. It's discounted to a degree. So if they're not on board, you'll get them on board over time. But frankly, they work for you. <laughs> They work for you are the client and you're kind and you're patient and you're advocating. And this is what it takes. This is what federal judges tell us to do. Whether you do it or not is up to you. I love that you're doing it. Continue doing it. Kent, let's come to you. And then Mr. Carper, I'll come to you. Kent, you kind of dealt with this a little bit over three or four years, right? Like just wait, slow down. We'll hire someone when it's ready to go to prison. But you were like, I think you saw the videos with the judges and you're like, I got to change it. So what did you do? Yeah, well, I started working with you guys probably about two years ago. So it was, and I was in a very similar spot. My attorney was not necessarily a fan of, of me doing the work. They kept, she kept telling me that it's good. Like, don't worry about it. We, we're going to do this. We've got it handled, all that kind of stuff. And there's a whole ton of reasons. And I'm happy to talk to anybody about it if they ever want to call me and speak about some of the things I did, because it's going to be too much to talk about on just a quick brief thing. But I would say the overwhelming part of this that started to drive it was, is like Justin said, they are my attorney. And I kept putting this perspective in my head going, if I want a different result, I've got to start doing things differently because every other defendant's going to walk in and let their attorney talk. Every other defendant's not going to write a narrative or not going to do this or not going to prepare for their sentencing statement the way that I wanted to, to try and get a different result. So for me, it started to become, and I've got four kids. So I wanted to really be able to start to do this thing to justify. At the end of the day, I wanted to know that I did everything I possibly could to try and get the best outcome. Because then of ultimately at the end, you end up kind of passing this over to the judge and you have no idea what's going to be uh, the most impactful to where they don't care at all. But I wanted to be able to go in when I surrendered to know that at least I tried everything I could. And fortunately for me, I ended up getting a really good result. But it starts with, I guess, back to your, your part with um, Steve, preparing for your PSR is huge. That, that document is, is very important. So the more work you do and the more influence you can have, from our, from, I think from our understanding and what I've heard from Justin and the team, it's normally the first document that they read. So if, if you want to put in and start influencing from the very beginning who's going to be sentencing you, you need to start doing the work as soon as you possibly can. And that starts with your PSI. Uh, Mr. Carper, I'm going to come to you in a moment. I, I will say our team did recently create a new probation report course. If, if you want to learn more about it, just send us a message. It's how to prepare for the interview, overcoming objections in the interview, how to, how to respond to questions in the interview, properly disclosing substance abuse, mental health issues, how to create the narrative, when you should share the narrative with the probation officer. So send us a message or send an email. We can share a little bit more about the, the course with you. I will say that it's um, it can be difficult to hold a lawyer accountable, but if you're willing to do it, you truly do advance your agenda. And that includes sharing details. In part of our probation report course, I share details of a client of ours, Mike Stoll, many years ago. And I we put up the video with Mike. We sent, I think we included some transcripts from the sentencing judge. And when we worked on his narrative, the lawyer was very rude and disrespectful. And he called and he said something like, the lawyer doesn't effing care that Mike was delivering milk with his father at nine years old. And Mike was very concerned, like, oh my God, my lawyer hates this. Like, what do we do? And he said, I'm gonna go with what Judge Bennett told us I should we should do, I'm gonna do it. And in the sentencing hearing, his judge, and this is all in the transcript said, I really appreciated you sharing that story. When you were 10 years old about working with your father. I have a similar story. It's the only time I could spend time with my dad when I was working with him. And I know you have discipline and commitment and work ethic. And that he ended up getting probation. In the email he sent us, he said, I was expecting two to three years in prison. Can't guarantee that will happen. 
But Mike was willing to hold his lawyer accountable and say, I'm going to use my own judgment. I've been successful throughout my whole life. I have good cognitive thinking skills. I know what I'm doing, but I'm really doing what judges told me that I should do. I'm sorry that you're not on board. And he got the outcome that he wanted. So I convey to all of you, if it's the right message, identify with victims, lessons learned, remorse, plans moving forward, getting into very vulnerable, open and honest details, you never go wrong. You never go wrong. And that's something that all of you need to do. And lastly, I'll say on the narrative, some people say, oh, it's too long, it's too long. Your lawyer could turn in a 40-page memorandum, 80 of which is boilerplate stuff judges have seen uh, 17 million times. Let's make it unique by giving them your narrative. In fact, many lawyers with whom we work will say the memo, memo is great because of the personal information you gave us in the narrative. So we want you to take action and do it. Mr. Carper, I see your hand up. Excuse me, got to find the damn mute, mute button. Yeah. Uh, I'm a lawyer. I wasn't a criminal defense lawyer. So I, my only advantage being a lawyer is that I know what legal education is like, and I know how much time most law schools spend on anything other than criminal law and the and the conviction part. Uh, Post-sentencing, most law schools have nothing. Uh, Bureau of Prisons uh, concerns, most law schools teach nothing. Uh, lawyers are good at court. They don't appear to be particularly good at this, at least most of them, I think, uh, Michael and, and Justin have, uh, know some lawyers that do, in fact, uh, venture into what happens to somebody if they don't, in fact, get the not guilty plea or get the uh, sentencing that they hope. In my son's particular case, we didn't learn about prison professors earning freedom until after his sentencing. And God, I can't tell you how I regret that. Uh, because I don't think there's any question that we would have benefited tremendously if we would have been in the situation that you're in now, where we could begin the self-advocacy and learn the things that our lawyer, very good in court, didn't know or doesn't know. I mean, I just can go on and on uh, about the things that that I know now that he didn't know. Uh, and so self-advocacy, it, 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 I guess the bottom line is you have nothing to lose uh, by, in fact, be, being be better prepared, by doing everything you can to, to make your case better and to gain from the guidance of, of these webinars and and uh, and these people. You, you, you have nothing to lose. If your lawyers discount it, fine. Who cares? Uh, it, 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 it doesn't matter that they don't like it. You, they're not, in fact, responsible for it. They'll do their thing. Uh, Self-advocate. Do the work. It's, it's doing the work. And I will say sometimes when defendants hear it, they'll know what to do. And they may not do it because they say, my lawyer told me not to do it, though they know they're supposed to do it. But it does require work and attention and time to create. So some just say, I'm not going to do it. My lawyer told me not to, even though they know they should. It does, there's no elixir or magic pill here to swallow. It does require work. It does require time to, to change the narrative. And you should be documenting it thoroughly, like Lauren did with that video. I mean, no blaming, no owning it, talking about it. That will build and grow and evolve. You've got to memorialize it somehow, some way with the idea that you're dealing with a very cynical judge that you're dealing with. A, a, I had a very cynical judge. He ran the fraud division in the 80s for the U.S. Attorney's Office in Los Angeles. He was not a fan, but I still worked to change the narrative. Character reference letters. All of you facing sentencing, can you guarantee that your lawyers read every single letter? Let me tell you why that's relevant. A lot of lawyers, and I want to be careful, I'm not indicting all lawyers here. Many of them won't read the letters. They'll attach them to the memo. But I know Judge Gonzalez Rogers in San Francisco said sometimes letters lead her to give a longer sentence because they can enable the defendant's conduct. That happened with Elizabeth Holmes, in my opinion. I filmed a video called Elizabeth Holmes Disastrous Character Reference Letters. We also have a character reference course 
If you have not sat for the probation report course, you should get that course. We'll go through it. Even if you did the PSR, you should go through it because you can make changes. The point is make sure your lawyers read your letters and they're just not attached because Judge Gonzalez Rogers said sometimes letters come in that continue to blame or excuse the defendant's conduct. And they don't align with what I want to hear, which is remorse and lessons learned, or frankly, just speaking about the person's character. So make sure the lawyers read the letters. In my case, while I had a tough judge, uh, Judge Wilson departed, and he commented on my six letters. I had 16 letters. I only turned in six. Very strategic, because I knew Judge Wilson didn't want to be bombarded. He's the type of judge that he will cut off the victims when they're speaking. Right. It's just he's very direct, doesn't want to waste more time than is necessary. So know your judge, get the character reference letters, create that narrative. And I will lastly say, let's just say you get the narrative to the probation in officer for the narrative for your PSR interview, which you should. If you're building and documenting things in your life, you may have an updated narrative for your sentencing judge months later. That happens with people. I have my PSR sentencing is delayed for a year. Will you update the narrative? And the judge can see the PSR like, wow, you got this for the probation officer. Now you wrote another one for me. Yes, Your Honor, because I'm continuing to develop and grow and learn and work to overcome this. Since then, I got a new job driving for Uber. Yes, I have a PhD from Yale. I'm now driving for Uber. It's the only place that would hire me. I'm including 100 five-star reviews I got. It's like we've gotten people in our community have been told by judges, I'm impressed that you are doing this. Why? Because they think we're greedy, entitled, and arrogant who would sit at home before doing a job that is beneath our skill set. Embrace that. Recognize that. Use it to your benefit. It's advocacy throughout the, the whole stage of the journey. Only you can do it. Only you can do it. Presuming you want what all of us want, which is the shortest sentence and to get out there as quickly as possible. Because it's the only time you're going to go through it. Your lawyer will have hundreds of cases if there are any good. This is your only time. So don't look back. Many of you already look back through this process with regret. I would have done this differently. I wish I hired this lawyer. I didn't know. Stop. That's why we do this. No more regrets. No moss. No moss. No moss. And our, our next webinar or two, I see that Hugo, we've gone long. My good friend Hugo Mejia is home from prison. Hugo, I want to wait for a couple of webinars. We'll share the story in some. Hugo is featured heavily in uh, the New York Times article that ran last year on our company. Scott, if you can maybe put a link up to, to that, people may have interest in that, or I can. But the New York Times followed us for about 14 or 15 months. Jack Hitt, a reporter, and one of the clients they followed was Hugo. Uh, Jack Hitt went to the sentencing hearing. It was a very elaborate, uh, detailed process. And Hugo did a great job, and he ended up getting 36 months in prison, and he got home and nine months, nine and a half months. And I'm going to wait, Hugo, till our next couple of webinars to, to talk more about it. But we put up a link to the New York Times article and Hugo's featured uh, heavily in that article, including a, a photo of him. We'll save that for the next webinar, Hugo. But well, welcome home. He's in the halfway house now in Riverside. Okay. But that's the power of mitigation, by the way, to give you a little teaser when we discuss it. He had an okay lawyer. I actually think he had a federal public defender. But Hugo's like, the lawyer's not on board with anything that I'm doing. To Mr. Carper's point, he goes like, I'm just going to do it. <laughs> I'm just going to do it. And he did. And, you know, instead of five or six years, he got 36 months. He was home in nine months. Pretty good. Pretty, pretty good, as Larry David would say. That said, it's 1137. Are there any questions unanswered or anything that we've missed? It's a big negative. Okay. So grateful that all of you are here. To next week, I am going to be in Atlanta. I'll be on an airplane at this time. I'm going to Atlanta to see some clients. Also going to sit for, uh, do a little bit of media work. If Michael's back in town, he will lead the webinar. If not, we'll skip a week, but I'll have clarity in a couple of days. I will send out the replay of this webinar along with the resources we mentioned, Lauren's video, links to the judges, everything, you'll have it. Uh, and I'll provide some clarity in the next couple of days on next Thursday. Sound good? All Thanks right. And by time. the way, to learn more about that probation report course, send, send us an email. If you haven't sat for the PSR, or even if you have, if you haven't been sentenced, you still have an opportunity to make changes to the probation report. So that's, feel free to send us a message. We can discuss it further.
Okay. Um, actually, I saw a message come in. We can deal with that. Um, let me just ask this question. Let me just answer this question. Someone said, my attorney said I should hire a tax CPA versus you guys because he'll take care of the mitigation stuff. I, I don't mean to be disrespectful. Like, I want you to get good at asking really good questions. Like, what does that mean? <laughs> okay. That's like the first question. Like, what does that mean? You're going to take care of the mitigation stuff. He, the lawyer may say, well, I'm going to write the sentencing memorandum. Yes, but that is in the third person, is it not? Buck is a good person. Buck didn't mean to do this. Buck did not have bad intentions. All third person writing, which according to Judge Boo and Judge Bennett and others is discounted by judges because the lawyer's paid to say that you're a good person. In our experience, you've got to write it. You've got to do the first person mitigation. I'm not averse to subject matter experts like hiring a CPA to account for losses and, and whatnot. That's fine, I suppose. But what does that have to do with your own first person mitigation. It's like comparing football to baseball. They're two totally sports. There's a ball. Other than that, there's no correlation. That doesn't make any sense. So what I want you to do, Buck, is ask your lawyer very specific questions like, what does that mean? <laughs> Can you provide evidence with other clients where you've done the mitigation? Are you going to interview me and spend 30 hours on the narrative? Are you going to interview people on my network and write their character reference letters? Are you going to spend hours preparing me for the probation report? Are you going to help me write my release plan to try to advance? What does that mean you're going to do the mitigation? I suspect when you do that, it's going to default to, well, I produced the sentencing memorandum. <laughs> That's how the lawyer mitigates. That's not how you mitigate. You've got to ask better questions. And then I'd encourage you to watch the videos with the federal judges and decide who's right, a federal judge? And I'm not saying your lawyer doesn't have good intentions. Your lawyer wants to help you. But that doesn't necessarily mean they're conveying the right message just because they've done it a certain way for a long time. Follow the advice of federal judges. Let those judges guide you. Ask better questions. Um, uh, someone said, I sent my narrative to my PO who did my PSR. My sentencing keeps getting pushed back. How do we, should we update the narrative closer to sentencing? Of course, you, you, you want to update. We can update the narrative. We're working together. Up a little interview, update it. You have the original document to the probation officer. We update it. Your lawyer's sentencing memorandum should be turned in a week or two before sentencing. Tragic, by the way, we got a call from someone who said, uh, my sentencing hearing is on March 14th. What is the sentencing memorandum? I said, oh, it's already been turned into the court. <laughs> and he's like, oh, my God, what do you mean? I'm like, yes, you're getting sentenced on March 14th. It's March 9th or yesterday this happened. I'm like, it's already been turned in. He, I said, reach out to your lawyer. Ask him if you can be involved in the memorandum process. The lawyer said it's already been turned into the court. The client, the defendant's like, well, shouldn't I be involved in this document? He hasn't even seen it, didn't even share it with the client. So good tidbit for all of you if you have yet to be sentenced. Be involved in that sentencing memorandum. Get it a week or two before it's due so you can be involved in it. Updating the narrative. Yes, your updated narrative will augment the sentencing memorandum your lawyer will turn in. It should also be in the probation report. So these, this is just mitigation, but don't wait. Get that. You should... Get several copies of your lawyer's sentencing memorandum. This uh, this upsets some lawyers too, actually. So, Steve, I'm the Steve over there. I want to give you some insight, something that you can do if you want to hold your lawyer accountable and also possibly upset them at the same time. Ask for if you had hired us or hired if we'd work with you before you hired a lawyer. Here are some questions you would have asked the lawyer. Can you send me a few sentencing memorandums you produced? And they would say, Well, why? You could say, Well. Let's just say you wrote a sentencing memorandum and you asked in the memorandum that your client get two years and the government gets four years. I want to see like some of the outcomes of your work, right? Like, were you successful? Show me some wins. So let me see three of them. Some lawyers will say, I can't share that with you. It's privileged information. Well, did you see what Shai and I did with his release plan? We spent three minutes on Adobe Acrobat blocking out the names. Okay. It's not hard. Get some sentencing memorandums, but in so doing, you will kind of learn, and this comes to us from lawyers, how boilerplate a lot of them are, because it's the same statutes that judges have seen. So it's like 80% written. So I'd get a few sentencing memorandums to see how successful they have been. And then you're going to think, well, you guys told me you do the mitigation, like there's nothing in here on my behalf. It's all boilerplate stuff. Where's my narrative in my letter? So I'd get sentencing memorandums now. 
And I'd be very involved in it and make sure your lawyer knows that you want to receive it well in advance before it's due. So you don't call me like this defendant in Virginia called yesterday to say, I'm sentenced on the 14th. Uh, where's my memorandum? And then he called the lawyer and the lawyer said, I already turned it in. It's too late. It's like, what? I'm the client. I can't review this important document. And I also learned that he wasn't prepared for the probation report either. You've got to do the work. You've got to ask tough questions, which is why we're here. So Rob, to your question, we'll update the narrative before sentencing. We, you may have dated a hundred times before we die. That's the way it works, right? You blah, I mean, that's how it starts. You'll update it a million times, but we'll do it again before sentencing. Is that a wrap? I tried to do my wrap five minutes ago and I kept going like James Brown. I left and I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> If you haven't done the, people are calling now. This is what happens when we run long. People are calling, there's things going on. Okay, we're gonna wrap it up here. We'll be back in touch very soon. If you haven't done the PSR course, send an email. We gotta get you that course, you gotta prepare. Lauren, you're awesome. Thank you for sharing. Lauren, I'm gonna share the video with everyone when I send the replay out, okay? All right, good. All right, I've enjoyed our conversation today. Thank you for letting me talk the whole time. I'll, be, I'll see you soon, bye-bye. <laughs>